Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Um, I'm going to try to consolidate this better than I did last week. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, to the human brain, as scripture always is, it's counterintuitive because, you know, we would say, blessed are the aggressive because they shall inherit the earth, or blessed are the violent because they shall inherit the earth, or great are the, you know, blessed are the great military strategists because they shall inherit the earth. But it doesn't say that, does it? It says just the opposite. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And remember that word meek comes from two Greek words, one meaning gentle and the other meaning to suffer and endure. And, you know, I'm not going to go through that whole list of meanings because really the word meek in the Greek and in the Hebrew is actually a word of great strength. And that's what I really want you to take away and be aware of. Um, you know, you read in the commentators and they say all the time, meekness is not weakness, and it really is true. Meekness means strength and power that's under control. And so it's, it's talking about someone who could use force and strength to enforce their authority, but someone who chooses not to. Instead, they are gentle. But it's also someone who can be gentle in their responses as they suffer, which is so supernatural because we don't do that when we're suffering and when we hurt, what do we do? We lash back. We want to get even. We want to inflict pain on the one giving us pain. And so this meekness is really a supernatural grace of the Holy Spirit at work within us. But just to uh, summarize a little bit, meekness is the grace to act and react. And a lot of times the reacting is what gets us. It's the grace to act and react free from self-promotion, free from self-preservation, free from retaliation. And we'll look at those words a little bit here in a moment. Meekness seeks to exalt God and promote his will, not self. And that second phrase there where it says that it seeks to exalt God, that's where meekness can actually become very bold and very vocal. And that's where meekness can actually become very violent in seeking the will of God and making sure that God is exalted in all things. It's just... It's not a lack of boldness or a lack of strength. It's who you are strong for. And meekness is being strong for the Lord instead of being strong for yourself. When we refuse to promote or, project or protect self by committing ourselves into the will and care of God, we open the door for God to supernaturally move on our behalf. And I want you to think about that, and I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures as we go through them quickly tonight. But when you move in meekness, and you don't take matters into your own hands, but you commit yourself into the hands of God for him to move and for him to work, that is when he can do his greatest work. That is when the power of God is released on your behalf. But if you act or react from self-promotion, self-preservation, or retaliation, meaning what? You take this circumstance back into your hands, and you're going to control it, and you're going to get even, and you're going to make things right, we perpetuate and accelerate a cycle of defeat and failure. You know, right now, I, I think uh, the greatest, and I want to be ginger with this because it's kind of a sensitive subject, but I think you can really see that in what's happening in Ferguson, Missouri right now. You know, there are some, I guess you would call them peaceful protesters who are trying to do it lawfully and peacefully, and then you have the other segment that's doing it violently but you can see how when you respond to violence with violence, it just makes things what? Worse. You know, remember what your mom always used to tell you, two wrongs don't make a right? And, um, and I'm not passing any judgment, you know, on the policemen and whether it was right or wrong. I have no clue. So I'm not passing any judgment on that actual act. I'm just saying, you know, when, when you retaliate with a vengeance and with bitterness, and you're going to get even, and you're going to hurt back because someone hurt you, boy, what a mess we make of things. And so uh, that's never the way to go. Some life examples of where meekness really is needed. Have you ever had someone take credit for work that you did and pass it off as your own? That can get you a little hot under the collar, right? Especially when it's something that you worked a long time on. 
when someone accuses you and lies about you falsely and unjustly, you know? I like it when, you know, I hear things that other people say about this church, but they've never been to the church and even know whether what they're saying is right or wrong. That, that can kind of get to you, you know, every now and then. I'm sure you've experienced the same thing on many different levels. When someone criticizes or puts you down to exalt themselves, when someone says something that causes pain and injury spiritually, psychologically, or emotionally, persecution or abuse, all of those things are things that are injurious towards us and provoke something in us that wants to lash back, make it right, get even, settle the score, and that's where meekness comes in. That gentleness under pressure. That gentleness which is power under control. You could say something, you could strike back, you could do something to even the score, but you choose not to. That's called meekness. You're being gentle even though you are suffering. Uh, just very quickly, Jesus addresses the heart attitude here. In Matthew 5, verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Didn't, just, didn't that just rub you the wrong way? Have you ever passed over this passage in the Bible because you didn't want to read this part of the Sermon on the Mount, it just didn't make sense to you, and you certainly didn't want to do it, because we're born, you know, good old red-blooded Americans, and we're going to stand up for our liberties and stand up for our rights, and this just smacks right in the face of that, doesn't it? See, this is the meekness that Jesus is talking about, and it's talking about being free from that temptation to settle the score, to strike back, to, serve, to preserve self, to protect self. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. And you think, why? Why, why should I love someone who is persecuting me, hating me, lying about me, hurting me? Why should I love that person? Because God loved you. And that's the answer. Because he loved you when you were desperately lost in your sin. And we are to be just like our heavenly father. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And we wouldn't do it that way, would we? Uh, we'd send rain on the just and we'd send fire and brimstone on the unjust. That, that would be our method. And one day that is going to happen in God's timing, in God's way. But for right now, this is what Jesus has ordained for us, for us to do right, even though wrong is being done to us. For us to respond to wrong with what's right. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. And we've been talking about sanctification. This is what will set you apart as a child of God. When others are persecuting you, lying about you, maligning you, stealing from you, abusing you, and you love them and do good to them anyway. It's a supernatural heart. And he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So I would encourage you to begin to pray for that kind of a heart. This really comes, becomes helpful in the home with the marriage because when, you know, sometimes in some of our marriages, believe it or not, we get a little disgruntled with each other and things might come out of our mouth that are a little sharp or bitter and we end up hurting one another's feelings. And when that happens, can you return love to your spouse instead of hurting them or trying to hurt them like they hurt you? See, meekness will refrain from hurting them back. And meekness will do good and love them instead. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, 
He did not revile in return. Supernatural, isn't it? What love. What dedication and commitment to good, to what's right, what's godly. When he suffered, he did not what? Threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And remember, he was, you know, especially the passage that we were just reading back there in Matthew 5, Jesus is talking to who? The Jews. And they're walking around with a big old chip on their shoulder and a grudge in their heart and a lot of bitterness towards the Roman government. And he's trying to, he's not condoning what Rome is doing and he's not saying that Rome is right. A lot of things that Rome did were absolutely wrong. He's just saying, you've got to guard your own heart because that bitterness is going to destroy you. It's not going to destroy Rome. So you've got to guard your own heart from the unforgiveness and from that hatred that's uh, just festering in there. Luke 22, verse 47, we see Jesus actually living it out. When he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. This was the betrayal. And Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And we know that was Peter. I think Mark is the one that reveals the identity. But Jesus said what? No more of this. And he touched his ear and he healed them. If you, do you remember uh, what happened just a few verses above in this same chapter? Jesus was the one that told them to bring the swords. And so I'm sure that when this incident arose, they're thinking, oh, this is why Jesus told us to bring the swords. We can actually use them. Uh, but that's really not why he told them to bring the sword, was it? He told them to bring the sword uh, for self-defense, but when you're suffering in the will of God, meekness never strikes back for that suffering. Meekness is, submits, is submissive to the will of the Lord. Remember this passage, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, which says that Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. So I wanted to show you some examples in Moses' life where this meekness really comes to light. And I think you'll appreciate these examples. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1. <clears throat> now Korah and Dathan and Abiram took men and they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. So these were leaders in Israel. These were the guys that were respected, the spiritual ones. And they rose up against Moses in rebellion. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you've gone too far, for everyone in the congregation is holy, every one of them, and, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So they're rebelling against his authority and uh, questioning his authority. And what did Moses do in verse 4? He falls on his face. This would have been a great argument, wouldn't it? Great shouting match, great debate. Maybe a few fists would have been thrown in the whole deal. I mean, Moses, Moses had every human right to strike back. But watch what he says in verse 5. But he said to Korah and all his company, in the morning, who? The Lord will show who is his. See, this is the very working definition of meekness. Just like Jesus healed Malchus's ear and told them to put the sword away, it's not going to be done this way. Here we see Moses, again, in a different example, he's refusing to exert his will, refusing to defend himself, He's going to let the Lord defend him. And he's going to let the Lord take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. And so when we get in situations, can we do that? You know, I, I was blessed one time. There's a, and I won't tell you all the surrounding circumstances because we don't have time. But in, in the eight or nine years that I've worked for my company, I've had one bad performance review. And uh, it was the only year that I had this one particular manager. He actually got laid off two or three months after this performance review. 
but he didn't agree with the way that I had handled things, uh, particularly in a certain situation, and so he gave me a bad review. And when I walked into his office, and you know when, whenever your boss says, well, come in and shut the door, you, you know it's not good. It's probably not cake and ice cream waiting for you in there. So I shut the door, and um, I could tell he was really nervous just by his body language and posture and his speech and so forth. And he, you know, he started to tell me why he graded me the way that he graded me. And I was just, I was really pleased with the Lord. I, I'm not bragging on myself, but I just sat there and I said, okay, I understand. You want me to go ahead and sign now? Because you know how you have to sign on the line that, that you understand the review. And um, I didn't, I still don't think that his perspective was right. I, I think I probably could have done a lot of things better. Now looking back, I learned a lot through that whole experience. So I'm not saying that I was guilt free, but um, I didn't do anything maliciously or intentionally. I know that. Uh, but when you're in that type of a situation, you know, the flesh is so tempted to want to justify yourself, explain yourself, fight back, take it to the HR, protest, do whatever. And I just, I had this peace just come over me. And God can give us that peace in every situation like that if we will just let him. And it was a thing where I, I didn't have to fight back. I was just so keenly aware at that time that the only opinion that mattered was the Lord's. And I knew that I had done everything that I thought was right. And uh, so I just committed it to the Lord and said, Father, this is in your hands. And you know, when you get a bad review like that, you don't know if you're going to have a job the next day or the next week or if they're trying to move you on or whatever. But I just had a, a peace that my life and my job and this situation was in God's hands and whatever needed to be done, God would do it. And I didn't have to fight it. And that's, I, I really see that in Moses here, this grace working in him to just say, you know what, guys, I'm not going to fight you. Let's just wait for the morning. The Lord will tell us who really belongs to him, who he has chosen. And he said, do this. Take censers, put fire in them, put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. And then he makes this statement. And you know, you can make statements like this in perfect meekness. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. When can you make statements like that? When can you bring a rebuke to people like this? When your trust is in God and you're not trying to defend or justify yourself. When you leave it totally in the Lord's hands and what's coming out of your mouth is, not, is now not coming from a spirit of hatred or revenge or bitterness or retribution or retaliation, but you're free from all of that, you've committed it to God, and now you can see clearly to bring the rebuke of, sons of Levi, you're the one that's gone too far. Remember when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh? This is another part of that boldness that I want to show you that I was just speaking of, if Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that may, they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And of course, Pharaoh pushes back, says, I don't know your God. Why should I listen to him? But notice, on what authority was Moses speaking? Thus says the Lord, let my people go. He wasn't trying to promote his own agenda. This wasn't his own personal vision. He, he was meek in himself. He wouldn't even defend himself to the other Israelites, but yet he'd stand before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. This is from the Lord. And so meekness, you can become very bold about God's will, but you're willing to surrender your own personal will. And you become very jealous of God's reputation but you're willing to let your reputation die. That's meekness. Watch what he says here in verse 3. Then they said, the God of Hebrews has met with us. You see where his boldness is coming in? His boldness is coming from the fact that this was not originating in him. In fact, if you can read between the lines, he's, Moses is probably thinking, look, guy, I tried to talk God out of this. I didn't want to do this. I told him I wasn't the right man but here I am anyway. Let his people go. 
and he could speak on that authority because he had been with God. And this was God's will, God's agenda, God's plan, not anything personal that he was contriving. Now at the same time, I wanted you to see that meekness sometimes does speak up. And I think Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, is that Holy Ghost common sense that we really need to operate in this world. Because if, if you're like me, a lot of times you're in a quandary. Well, do I say something or do I not say something? Or what should I do, Lord? He says, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be what? Be wise as serpents. Realize that there's people out there that are going to hate you. They're going to lie about you. They're going to smile to your face and then stab you in the back. So be wise. Know, know the God of this world, Satan, and know how his children behave. But then at the same time, be what? Be innocent, or the King James says, harmless as doves. That is meekness. Even though I know what you are, and even though I know how evil you can be, I'm not going to try to retaliate or vent my vengeance. I'm going to do good to you because God sends rain on the unjust just like he does the just, and I want to be like my father. So even when you're doing bad to me, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm wise to that, I know what's going on, I understand, I'm going to be as harmless as a dove back to you because that's what my father is. In here, in this, and this is kind of the balancing act to meekness, I want you to see some things relating to the balance of meekness. He says, do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to what? Attack you. So here, you know, this is where you're being wise as a serpent. And I'm showing you this verse, and then I'm, I want to show you this next verse just to say... Uh, Many time, most of the time, God does not want you to just sit there a victim of abuse. You can see here in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, when they persecute you in one town, do what? Flee to the next. If you're being persecuted, if evil is being done to you, if, if you are a victim of abuse, get out of town. Nothing says you have to stay there and take it unless there is some other overriding you know, priority where you need to stay there for some reason, uh, like for a loved one or for a child or whatever. But here Jesus is saying, you don't have to stay there and take it. Flee. Get out of town if necessary. He's saying back here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, there's boundaries. You don't have to give everything over to the pigs because they will turn and attack you. Be, be smart. Be wise about this. But you can never respond in a vengeful way hateful way. Here in uh, John chapter 18, verse 19, very interesting part of the story of Jesus' last day when he's before the high priest, Annas. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all of the Jews came together. I haven't said anything in secret. Why are you asking me what I've taught? Ask those who've heard me what I said to them. They know. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you're supposed to answer the high priest? Now why did Jesus do this? And I'm showing you this example just to say there's times when you need to speak up. And Jesus in speaking up here and pushing back, to use our terminology of the day, he was doing so in perfect meekness. Because actually the high priest was trying to tempt him not to be meek. This question in verse 19, uh, the high priest was trying to, to uh, provoke him to say something in his defense, to, to justify himself. And Jesus knew that whatever he said wouldn't be good enough. It wasn't going to change the outcome of this at all. But Jesus refused to be anything other than meek. And so he was wise as a serpent here. And basically, he's saying, you know what? I'm not going to answer your question. You're trying to tempt me to take up and defend myself, and I'm not going to do it because this is the will of God for me, so I will submit. And as you're doing evil to me, I would do good for you, and I'll go to the cross and die for you. 
And then this story in Acts is kind of amusing. Remember when uh, Paul was thrown into prison this one time, Acts chapter 16? But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Now, how many of you would bolt, man, I'm out of here. Thank God this is over, right? What did Paul do? But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, they've thrown us into prison, and now they want to throw us out secretly? No, let them come and escort us out. Isn't that great? But you know, meekness will have you do things like that at times when justice needs to be served. They uh, notice here, Paul stayed in prison. He didn't start any riots. He didn't try to set the prison on fire. He didn't pass around petitions to the rest of the inmates. He didn't, that probably would have gotten him killed. But you know what I'm saying? He didn't, he, he was there submissively in the prison. He wasn't trying to rebel or revolt. But that's when through his meekness, there came this opportunity to make a point and to make the point of you guys did something which was unjust. And here's an opportunity where you can make it right. And what he was asking them to do, he wasn't getting any revenge or joy out of this. This wasn't hurting them at all. And so what did they do? So the police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. That's kind of humorous. Just, whatever you do, just get out of town, please. You're causing too much trouble. But see, all of these things uh, are meekness. Meekness is, is being bold for God, strong for God, wanting to exalt God and never exalt yourself. And uh, being willing to suffer wrong and to do good in return for evil. And uh, many people might say that that's a doormat, that that's weakness, but it's really not. It shows some of the greatest strength when you can refrain from the natural impulses of revenge and do good in return for the evil that you're receiving. And then to balance that out, we see these other situations where you need to speak up, and it's time to speak up, and God provides, it provides opportunity for justice to be heard and met out. So that's kind of the balance to meekness. There's a lot to it. It's a big topic. It's a big word. And um, that's why we couldn't cover it in one night.